I think that the desire to vent is really understandable. People are feeling really stressed. They're feeling in such conflict and they need a place to be able to express those feelings. And so I think that's completely understandable. Welcome to the follow-up question. I'm your host, Michael Ashford. Come with me on a journey as I explore what it means to find common ground at a time when it feels increasingly harder to do so, to listen more than we speak so that we can understand that our differences don't have to divide us. My aim with this show is to bring you perspectives and ways of looking at issues or topics that perhaps you haven't considered before so that you can then take that new knowledge and apply it to your ability to empathize with the people around you. I'm a former journalist who believes everyone has a story to tell, and it's only when we ask questions and listen that we truly reveal what connects us as humans. Our dreams, our desires, our experiences, our ideas, and who we truly are. Think about a divisive issue we face these days. Pick any one. There's no shortage, right? I mean, if I even just say the word mask, I'd be willing to bet you just felt some fairly strong emotions rise up. So whatever topic you land on, and perhaps let's just stick with the mask topic. I want you to think about your views on that issue. Where do you fall? What's your opinion? How did you come to this belief? Now, I want you to think about the quote unquote other side. Think about what someone who believes opposite of you would say about that same issue. Can you articulate their position? I mean, sure you can, but let me up the ante a little bit here with a little bit of specificity. Can you articulate their position without condescension, assumptions, sarcasm, or stereotyping? Take a moment and sincerely try to articulate a view that is opposite of your own. Did you do it? It's uncomfortable, I get it. It's really, really hard to not let your biases and assumptions about the other side cloud your ability to articulate their views. Because chances are, your view of the other side is far more extreme than what is actually true. And so we surround ourselves with echo chamber bubbles and feel good and right and righteous. This is exactly the mindset that is the focal point of my interview with this week's guest. Tanya Israel is a psychologist, author, and speaker, and a professor at the University of California. And as part of her work, she has facilitated educational programs and difficult dialogues about a range of divisive topics, including abortion, law enforcement, religion, sexual orientation, and she's written a book titled Beyond Your Bubble. Tanya and I have a fantastically enjoyable conversation about how often we view others who disagree with us in far more extreme ways than what is actually true about them and how this affects our ability to achieve common ground and how understanding doesn't always mean agreement. I want to read you something that you said during your TED talk, how to win a political argument. And then I want to ask you a question based off of it. You said during that talk, it's not enough to think that you understand someone. It's important to actually understand them. And even more, you have to show them that you understand. I know you've done a ton of research in this field and in, in how we communicate and how we cooperate with each other. Is the gap getting wider there, Tanya? Like, is it becoming harder for us, to, the gap between thinking we know someone and actually knowing them? That's such a great question, because I, I think that we have lots of ways that we make assumptions about what people are thinking and feeling behind some small thing that they say. And so someone can say something like, well... I'm not really sure I'm ready to get the vaccine. And we think, oh my gosh, they're an anti-vaxxer. And this whole 
narrative about that that we've been hearing in the media, we put that onto that person. Or someone is wearing a t-shirt that says Black Lives Matter and we go, oh, well, then they want to abolish the police and that's what this means. And it's like we have these phrases and slogans that sort of trigger this whole narrative for us that we're not really going beyond that and exploring, oh, tell me more about what that means to you and, and really trying to understand what it means for that person. Why is it so, why is it such a rush to have that opinion about them? Have you been able to pinpoint that? I think that we don't realize we're rushing, that we even might think that we are, you know, having some exchange and, and someone will say something and then we go, oh, okay, I just, I just know what that means. And we don't think that we're rushing to a conclusion. We don't often have models of sort of how to really take our time with it, though, and how to really have those kinds of conversations that will get underneath it. Okay, you just mentioned models, but you created a flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> Dive into In, that. Can you explain that and what that is? Absolutely. So I started this work, um, I started this work decades ago, but most recently, following the 2016 election, it was so clear that people were really struggling with how do we connect across the political divide. So I created this thing that I call the flow chart that will resolve all political conflict in our country because I'm optimistic like that. <laughs> and, you know, spoiler alert, it has not actually resolved all political conflict in our country, but I tend to think that's just a distribution issue. So, as you know, once, once everybody's got this in their hands, we'll be fine. The, the main point of it is to help people to be more intentional about whether or not they want to enter these conversations. And if they do, how do you do it in such a way that you're going to meet your goals? Because when I ask people about what their goals are, I say, you know, what, what brings you to dialogue? And there are some things that come up time and time again. They say, I have somebody in my life who I'm having trouble staying connected to because of our politics, but they're important to me. Some people say, I want to convince or persuade other people. Some people are looking for common ground. And some people say, I simply cannot understand how people can think or vote or behave as they do. So I always take those goals into account. This is what people say they want. So how do you, how do you get there? You know, and, and it's pretty reliable the ways that you can get there. You, you can get there through listening um, and really giving somebody uninterrupted time to speak and listening in such a way that it draws them out rather than shuts them down. I'll, I'll pause there for a minute. That's a lot of information. So let me see where um, where I need to fill in some gaps. Yeah, the what struck me in looking at that flow chart, Tanya, was there were two. The first two, um, I guess, steps are questions to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. the The first one was, do I actually want to have a conversation with somebody whose views are differently than different than mine? And then the second one, which I found really interesting, that I'd love you to dive into, is. Um, Am I just looking for an opportunity to vent or or produce a diatribe? When is that healthy? I guess that's the question. Hello, kitty. <laughs> that's the question is, uh, when is it healthy to vent and just express everything that's pent up in us? And when is it damaging? So I think that the desire to vent is really understandable. People are feeling really stressed. They're feeling in such conflict and they need a place to be able to express those feelings. And so I think that's completely understandable. We might not be best at meeting our goals in finding support and an audience for that if we're doing that with somebody who has a very different political view. And especially if we're trying to maintain a relationship or trying to persuade somebody, that's not what's going to do it. So I always think, well, the place to do that kind of venting and getting that support is probably with people who already are on the same page as you are. And then maybe you can save a different kind of energy for having conversations with people who don't agree with you and who you are trying to do something with um, that disagreement so that you can bridge the divide. How do we keep from, and I know you wrote a book called Beyond Your Bubble, how do we keep from just sitting in the comfort of that, that 
world where we're venting to people who are like us and we never explore the beyond? I always go back to motivations. What it, what are you trying to accomplish? And and people tell me, you know, the things that they want to get out of it, the reasons that they're interested in dialogue. So I just try to remind people that that's something that they want. I I always think of dialogue as an opportunity, not a mandate. People always say, "Well, do I have to have these conversations with people?" And I say, "No, of course not. You know, that's that's always your choice." The thing that I'm seeing though is that people are shying away from those conversations because of certain perceptions that they have of what they think people across the divide are going to be like or what they think people who disagree with them or wear this t-shirt or say this thing or behave in this way. And so I think it's best to, okay, test that out. See if that's really what this, you know, is your cousin really thinking this way um, because they voted this way? So you can have an opportunity then to have a conversation with them and find out. If you say, I simply cannot understand how people can, can behave that way. Well, if you know somebody who behaves that way, What an opportunity that is to actually find out. But the first thing is you have to really want to. And that's part of the thing that, uh, you know, people need to sort out is, is your motivation to understand greater than your desire to, to vent or to stay in your own bubble? I'm struck by how many of your examples are, you know, those personal face-to-face relationships. Is it possible Mm -hmm. for us to have those conversations when it's not at the very least like what you and I are doing right now over a a Zoom call where I can see your face, I can read your emotions, I can can hear the inflection in your voice. Is it possible for us to have those types of conversations or does it need to be, does it need to be in a more, um, I'll say one-to-one personal Mm -hmm. setting? Sure. The research on perspective taking and being able to sort of put yourself in somebody else's shoes says that the more sources of information you have about somebody, the easier it's going to be for you to try to see things from their perspective, to really try to understand them. So the kinds of things that you're talking about, being able to see each other's nonverbal cues, to hear each other's vocal tone, all of that is incredibly helpful. The more of that we have, the better. So this is ideal being able to do something even over Zoom, even if you're not in the same room, or if you, um, you know, are are in the same place um, physically, then then that's also helpful. Even if you have a phone conversation with somebody, you get so much more from them than if you are texting with them or emailing with them. And for goodness sake, don't try to do this over social media. You know, there's so little information that we get about somebody from a social media post. And actually, there's fascinating research on, um, there's a study that they did on Twitter where they sent Uh, liberal quotes to Republicans and conservative quotes to Democrats. And it turns out that rather than, you know, we always think, oh, if I just make this argument to somebody, you know, that they'll see the light, that they'll see things differently. It turns out that we are actually more likely to push people apart, that people got farther and farther apart by seeing these contrasting tweets rather than going, oh, now I see things from a different view. That's not a reasonable expectation for what's going to happen with somebody, especially over social media. Do you do we know why that is? Like why in a in a conversation we are more considerate perhaps of of those differing viewpoints where when we're just reading it as, you know, lines of text on our Twitter feed, mm-hmm. that it is so we're so dismissive and even even angered by it. Well, some of it has to do with the public nature of social media. So it's it's not actually a setting where you're typically um, reflecting internally a lot and taking things in. It's, it's really a public facing kind of forum. And so when something's public facing and even, you know, public facing can even be in a one-on-one conversation in, in this context, then you are as a human being more likely to want to defend your beliefs than to change them. And we see this in so many social psychology studies that, that people, you know, when they are challenged on their beliefs, are more likely to get more firmly entrenched in them than they are to change their minds. And 
we keep thinking if we present people with factual information from sources that we think are reliable, then that's going to have any impact on them whatsoever. And if it does have an impact, it's more likely to just get them more firmly entrenched in their views than coming around to our side. And that's one of the things you also talk about is the the different or your TED talk, how to win a political argument. You actually reframe what winning actually is. Can you describe to the listeners now who may not he- have heard that, and I'll link it up in the show mm-hmm. notes, but how do we reframe winning a political argument? We often think about political conversations in terms of debate. And when we think about debate, you know, there's people who are making uh, arguments that they've crafted that are based on data. Sometimes they're drawing on emotion, but there's a judge of that. There's somebody evaluating who's going to win this, who's making the best argument. So often we go into these conversations thinking that that's our role, that our role is to be the best debater and that that's actually going to bring someone around to our side. You know, even in a formal debate, it's not about convincing the other team. Uh, that That's not something that we even think we can do in a debate. So in a conversation, that's certainly not something that is a reasonable goal to have, knowing the psychology of human beings. So what is it that we can actually do in those conversations? Well, if there's anything that's going to help you to understand somebody, help you to stay connected with somebody, um, or even help you to persuade somebody, it's really having a warm and caring and trustworthy relationship with that person and trying to understand them, you know, really going into it with some curiosity, with some humility and saying, you know, what will really benefit me most is to know where you're coming from. And that's going to get us farther in our, in any of our goals than bringing out, and I'm a researcher, but I know that Citing studies in here, I'm citing studies on your <laughs> podcast, but it's it's not the thing that's most likely to bring somebody around to your side. Why then do we rush to debate? Why do we bludgeon people with facts to try and get them to see our side when we, I think we all know that that doesn't work. I think we've all got experience knowing that that doesn't work. Where does that rush to debate come from? You know, I hear from people so much that they are having these arguments in their head with the radio or the TV or the person whose posts they see on social media that everyone's sort of crafting these arguments in their heads and figuring out what would I say to this person. And those kinds of, you know, people always ask me, they say, you know, what should I say? What kind of argument is going to make the most difference? And I say, well, it's not really about crafting an argument. It's really about cultivating a connection. And I think the reason that people want to craft the argument is because it feels safer in a way that if you can figure out what you're going to say, you can sort of go into this conversation with some degree of control because you're controlling what you're saying. What you can't control is what the other person's going to say and how they're going to respond. And it feels much more vulnerable going into a conversation, imagining that to be just more open and that you're just going to be there and you're going to hear what they say and you're not going to know what that's going to be. And you may be not going to know what that's going to feel like for you. And that is scary for people, I think, going into that not knowing what that conversation is going to be like. I relate so hard to what you just said in terms of crafting that response. I I think of the uh, first debate between President Trump and Joe Biden, how -hmm. it was just like a schoolyard bickering. I, I lost sleep that night thinking about how he would respond to both men (laughs) in that situation. And and something that you wrote about recently talked about how this is causing us, this is affecting our health, right? This is causing Mm -hmm. stress. Is that that the case? Absolutely. That people in the United States are increasing, are experiencing increased stress due to political conflict. And that stress isn't good for us. And I mean, you can talk to anybody who's feeling it and they they will know that. They know that they're losing sleep, that they're feeling this level of 
uh, emotional activation on a more consistent basis. And it's actually not healthy for us to have that kind of elevated reactivity um, on on a consistent basis, that we need to be able to take a breath. We need to be able to relax. And the more we are listening to the news, the more we are listening to this conflict. And I have to say, the media, they are doing their job, which is to try to uh, report what's going on, but also to try to get viewers. And the way to get viewers is to report the things that are going on that are more con- controversial. So they are much more likely to report on the extremists than they are to report on, frankly, the majority of people who are not extremists. Most people are not extremists. But it's more interesting TV to report on something um, that's going on that that's more violent even, that's more extreme than it is to interview someone who says, yeah, I can kind of see both sides of this situation. I want to come back to that, the the idea of how we view the other sides as being more extreme than they are and, and mm-hmm. the, ex- the idea of the exhausted majority. But I would love to understand where does your passion and desire to study this come from? How did you get involved in this in this field of research? And I've been realizing recently how I I am, you know, not like everybody. You know, a lot of people are struggling with this and and just wanting to blow their tops at other people. And I am going into these conversations going, oh my gosh, this is somebody who has a different view than I do. I can't wait to find out what it is. that's not where everybody is. So how did I get here? I was not always like this. And uh, back in the 90s, I actually started a group to bring together pro-choice and pro-life people to have dialogue with each other. Um, I was very firmly entrenched and still really am in the pro-choice camp. But I got to this point where I just didn't want to be so angry anymore. And I wanted to get what was going on with, with the other side. It was an absolutely transformational experience for me because it didn't change anything about how I felt about women's reproductive rights, but it changed so much of how I felt about people who disagreed with me about it. Because I found out that the people I was talking to and I was listening to were not necessarily the people who were protesting outside the clinics, that that's a very small portion of people who are pro-life. I also realized that if I was evaluating their conclusions of their opinions based on my experiences and values, that was just the wrong metric, that I needed to really understand their experiences and their values. And if I did, their conclusions made perfect sense. And I can see how we are always doing these kind of gotchas to the other side, like, oh, that's a logical inconsistency. Well, it's only a logical inconsistency based on my assumptions. It's not a logical inconsistency based on somebody else's assumptions. And, you know, the other thing is we all have logical inconsistencies. So it it made me a little bit more humble in terms of being able to recognize that there's another perspective that makes sense from that perspective. And it made me curious. I've also been for the last 20 some years, been doing research on LGBTQ issues. And that has just put me in conversation with people who have different views over all of this time. And it doesn't actually help me as a researcher to shut them down and point out why they're wrong. It helps me to know more about where they're coming from. Those um, sessions, I guess I'll call them in the um, in the '90s that you said you were bringing together pro-choice and pro-life advocates. What did those look like? How how were those facilitated? Mm-hmm. So I went to the head of the pro-life crisis pregnancy center in town. And I said, you know, can we talk? And and we, you know, had some meetings, we had some conversations. And I said, I'm interested in doing this thing. I can reach out to the pro-choice people, um, but I, I, you know, I don't have any credibility with the pro-life people. And so she reached out to the pro-life people and we would have these meetings in the library. So it was very neutral territory. We had some communication guidelines, like it's, 
we're going to try to use I statements, so speak from our own experience rather than making generalizations about other people. We're going to um, be respectful of other people's views. Some of that is even just calling people by the, you know, by the names or, you know, calling movements by the names that they want to be called rather than, you know, whatever our spin on that is. And it was it was really very much about listening and you know people sharing something and going oh okay like tell me more about that that the more we kind of can draw that out of other people the more we can ask them to elaborate then then the less we are relying on these slogans and and bumper stickers that sort of the extent of the conversation we usually have. You know, it was fascinating because I would also have these conversations like with the pro-life people or sorry, with the pro-choice people who I was more connected to. And we hadn't necessarily had conversations about our views and our experiences and our values. We were mostly talking about strategy kinds of things. And so it was really helpful to do that also, just to sort of have some more complexity to our understandings of each other. Did those conversations get uncomfortable? Sure. There are a lot of people who are not happy with me about doing work on dialogue across political lines. Uh, You know, people who think like you shouldn't be listening to the other side, that just gives them credibility. And, you know, that's not a good strategy. You should be like arguing against them. You shouldn't, you know, so uh, you, you shouldn't even be like, listening to them in a one-on-one conversation because that that says, oh, this is a valid perspective. And so, yes, those conversations can be uncomfortable. And even the conversations with people who are sort of supposedly on the same side as you, when you recognize that, oh, we actually do have some differences of view here, I think that can be uncomfortable, but it's also instructive um, because maybe that's a good place to sort of hone your skills about how to have disagreements when it's not in as heated a conversation as talking with somebody who is really much more on the other side of things. What do you, as you look back, I mean, it's been several several decades now, I, I guess I should mm-hmm. say, what, um, what were the outcomes of that? How do you think, quote unquote, both sides saw each other after those discussions and and conversations? Mm -hmm. I think just the fact of being in that room and knowing that there were people who were on the other side of this issue who wanted to listen and wanted to connect and wanted to have a conversation, I think that alone was transformative uh, because it made people feel like they were humanized by the other side. And we, we are so much more likely to demonize the other side. And again, that just, that pushes people away. It doesn't help to promote understanding. It doesn't change minds. It, um, it, it just makes us all more irritated with each other. So that reminds me of something else that you you I came across that you wrote recently, which was um, in your research where you're finding that we are more apt to label the other side as more extreme than they actually are. Am I articulating that correctly, Tanya? Yes. Yes. So there's decades of social science research um, and political science research that show that our estimations of what people's political views are based on their party affiliation, especially, um, or based on their voting behavior that we really don't understand. Like people who are more extreme really don't understand the more extreme people on the other side, that we're always thinking that the other side's more extreme than they actually are. The interesting thing is that it's the people who are in the middle, the people who are not as... um, opinionated about some of this or, you know, not as firmly implanted in and also not as emotionally activated by it. They are the ones who actually have a more accurate perception of both sides of the political divide. Where Where is the line that we draw between... <laughs> Let me see if I can ask this question, how it's rolling around in my mind. So there are obvious things that are wrong. You know, we'll say pedophilia and murder and stealing. 
and and I go back to what you just said a little bit ago, which is, you know, you're getting flack and anger from people saying, why are you even entertaining the other side? Where do we begin to butt up against those things that are very obvious and clearly wrong versus we have a moral or philosophical disagreement? Mm-hmm. That question well, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, typically there's not sort of a, an an active side that is pro murder, pro pedophilia. Yeah, I guess that's you know true. <laughs> that these are not. Um, and and some people would say, oh well, if people you know aren't supportive of gun control, then they're supporting murder. Or some people would say, if people aren't pro life, then they're supporting murder. You know that that we can frame the other side in terms of those kinds of values. I think that's where I was going. Yes. You stated it more eloquently than I. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that we need to do is find out more about, well, what does this mean to, to someone who believes this? And often there are some real similarities that underlie it. So we tend to be concerned about safety of ourselves, of the people we love, of our communities, of, of children. And you can, but you can think about that from a lot of different perspectives. I, I sometimes think about this in terms of abortion and guns, um, such divisive issues and people have such strong views about, well, the people who are pro-life are also probably more likely to um, be um, for gun rights and people who are pro-choice are more likely um, supportive of uh, restrictions on, on guns. And Again, you can look at safety from a lot of different perspectives. You can say, okay, well, if if you're not supporting gun control, then then you're putting our children at risk. And so you could also say, you know, on another side, well, if you're um, if you're not pro life, if you're not restricting abortion, then you are putting children at risk. And so if both sides are saying, we care about children and we care about protecting children, but have very different ideas about what that means, we can do a couple things about it. You know, we can always be trying to twist the, the other side's um, views and say, look how this doesn't make sense. You know, like, how can you be pro-life and also be for the death penalty? You know, so that's, you know, I can have a lot of, uh, you know, I can feel very satisfied sort of making this argument and say, oh, look, they, they're they illogical because of this. Well, they can make similar arguments about me. You know, like if, if, if you look, you can see, and they will too, that we all have these sort of logical inconsistencies in our, in our arguments. They're based on our values, though. So I'm really interested in knowing what are somebody's values? How are they understanding this? That just me sort of twisting their views around doesn't do anything to advance my goals um, unless my sole goal is feeling morally superior. And it'll certainly do that. It'll build me up that way. But it doesn't actually help to change anything. It doesn't help to humanize other people. And, And some people would say, well, it's not worth humanizing people who believe this or this or this. I actually think it's worth humanizing everybody um, because in a democracy, I feel like it's so important that we maintain our connections and that we're able to connect across disagreement. I, I, I think otherwise, um, you know, the more divided we are, the more vulnerable we are as a democracy. And so this is not just about saving people's relationships and friendships. It's also, I think, about really creating a stronger democracy. Hmm. I'm I'm reminded of one of the gotchas that I'm seeing right now is how can you be pro-choice and saying my body, my choice, but then mandating in favor of mandating vaccines? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and on the flip side, how can you be in favor of pro-life, but not uh, how I'm getting the logic twisted, but it's basically the flip of that. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I'm seeing that same thing. What did you say to the people who discouraged you from even discussing or or having conversations with quote unquote the other side how did you approach your conversations with those folks so again this is a different kind of dialogue across disagreement you know it's people who might agree with me politically but have a very different view in terms of strategy 
So one of the things that I always do is I want to understand, like, where are they coming from? What are they concerned about? Uh, And the things that I hear from people currently, like, let me talk about sort of what's going on currently around this, um, is, you know, people say, well, I... I have compassion fatigue, you know, I, I can't, I, you know, like people who are, who are vaccinated and who are talking about people who aren't masking and aren't vaccinated, they say, I just can't have any more compassion for those people. They're, you know, they're causing all of these problems um, for other people. They're, they're, they're causing um, people to, they're causing this pandemic to continue longer. It's unsafe for children. It's, um, it's unsafe for me, you know, all of these things. And they say, you know, I, I don't want to, to, you know, have a warm, caring conversation with that person. I'm furious with that person. And so then I want to know more about, well, all right, tell me a little bit more about that. What are you furious about? And, you know, tell me about that anger. And I had a conversation recently where somebody was talking about it. And when they were unpacking it, it turns out that they're not necessarily as angry at the individuals, but they're really angry at the politicians and the media who are, you know, crafting this narrative um, that that people are, you know, that that's sort of increasing vaccine hesitancy, you know, for people. And so it's like, okay, that's really good to know that your anger is is much more about these public figures uh, than it is toward these individuals. So maybe let's think about if you're going to have a conversation with these individuals, is that where you want to express your anger? You know, so really understanding what's underneath it, what's behind it, is is always going to lead to a more interesting and a and a conversation and one that is going to help to advance things rather than just create more barriers. You mentioned the the politicians and the media there, and and some of the role they're playing in stirring up these feelings of extremism. Where do you turn to? Um, to to remove yourself from that, if that's the correct phrase, to mm-hmm. to kind of shield yourself from this barrage that I think a lot of us are feeling. Sure. One of the things that I do, it's not even shielding, it's just amplifying other messages mm. in some way. So since I got involved in this work, I've gotten much more connected with individuals and organizations that are also working on this project of bridging the divide. And so I get to see all of the great work that they're doing. Uh, You know, I get the emails from Braver Angels and Living Room Conversations, and I see the social media from Civil Squared. And all of this is so encouraging. It makes me so optimistic because I know that I'm not alone in this. There are other people who are also doing these things. And that is really what kind of boosts me and and helps me, you know, sort of face all of the negativity about and, and pessimism about this that I might hear from others. What are the ramifications uh, for the exhausted majority if we don't seek that stuff out? So the exhausted majority in that term comes from the Hidden Tribe study. Um, and it identified, you know, these sort of clusters of people based on their politics and their values and and their voting behavior and things and saw that, yes, indeed, there are people who are more extremely on the left. There are also sort of more traditional Democrats. There are people who are more extremely on the right, and then there's more traditional Republicans. But most people are in the middle, and it's what they called the exhausted majority because these are people who they are tired of this conflictual rhetoric. And the thing about this conflict that's flying back and forth across them is it's making them want to tune out and it's making them uh, disengage from our democracy. We, it's unbelievable how many people don't vote. But if you, you know, and people say, oh, you know, both sides, they're just the same. And people on either side go, how can you think we're just the same as the other side? But what they hear as being the same very often is the tone, is the tone and the um, rhetoric about the other side. And so I think that people go, I don't want to invest in people who are just going to be, you know, fomenting conflict. I want to invest in people who are dedicated to finding solutions. And that's probably going to mean, you know, 
toning it down a little bit, not being so emotionally activated by all of it. They don't want to listen to that. You you had mentioned not not um, not voting right there. Mm-hmm. What other vulnerabilities to democracy do you see if we if we pour into the extremism on on the sides, the rhetoric? Where do those vulnerabilities exist? Do you think? Well, there's some interesting research about about democracies and about how people feel about living in a democracy and people who live in democracies are still like, yeah, it's good to live in a democracy, but they're not as dedicated to that and as enthusiastic about that as they used to be. And I, that concerns me because as flawed as democracy is, it's better than any of the alternatives that I can see. And I really value living in a democracy. Um, And I feel like if we are more divided, it's easier for us to be vulnerable to forces either within our country that are going to capitalize on that or forces outside our country that are going to capitalize on that. And I feel like we've seen a lot of both of those things happening. And, you know, we're called the United States for a reason. Um, there, there's the united part, which I think is important that we're connected, but there's also the states part. And, you know, people say, I live in California and people say, oh, well, I don't want people in, you know, Iowa or something um, determining, you know, uh, who's going to be my president, you know? And, and so why do they have as, you know, this many electoral college votes and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but the people in Iowa don't want the people in California making that (laughs) decision for them either. Um, Because there's some really different kinds of values. There's some different kinds of economies. There are things that draw people to different parts of the country for different reasons. And I honestly believe that our diversity is our strength. And we sometimes think about diversity in terms of people's ethnic background and, you know, how their ancestors came to be on this land. That's often how we think about diversity. And I do believe that that diversity is very important. I also believe that the diversity of thought, that the diversity of economy, that um, these kinds of diversities that, that make it so hard for us to come together in this country are such a strength for our country too, and always have been. There's always been disagreement in our country. If you don't know that, all you have to do is watch Hamilton (laughs) and you will be exposed to some really, you know, difficult conversations that people are having in the founding of our country. And I don't want to have duels. I want to have dialogue. And that's really where it's like, okay, we're always going to have some disagreement, but what do we do with that? And how do we use that to further strengthen and advance our country? What do you think is the biggest, perhaps, misconception of dialogue? The biggest misconception of dialogue is that you will need to compromise your values in order to do this. Uh, that that people say, we'll just by having a respectful conversation with somebody, that is compromising my values. So there's this whole literature on intellectual humility, which is a subset of cultural humility. And intellectual humility is about, you can have strong values, even more extreme values, but be respectful of and interested in other people's views. And that's a great stance to be in for dialogue, to go in with some curiosity and knowing that, you know, you've got your beliefs and hearing somebody else's beliefs doesn't need to threaten that. It doesn't need to threaten your views, your identity. Uh, You know, I keep hearing this from people, you know, how am I supposed to listen to somebody who doesn't even think I should exist? And I always say, well, I I think that that's really challenging if you feel like what they're saying is really targeting you specifically. Uh, So I always say, you know, you want to make sure that you're getting support, that, you know, you're deciding whether or not you're up for having this conversation. But then if you do want to have it, find out more about where somebody's coming from. Is it they really think that you shouldn't exist? And what does that mean even, you know? So, So I think digging down a little bit more and trying to find out 
what those meanings are for people can can really help us to develop an accurate understanding of somebody else that's not going to threaten us and that's that's not going to have to shift our values although it might shift our view of people who don't hold our values where do we where do we find that like where does that threat come from why do we feel so threatened just simply by having a conversation of, as you've advocated for the affiliations that we have with uh, with our values and with sort of ideologies um, and also with our identities and you know the, all of these things sort of put us um, uh, in, can put us in conflict with people who have different ideologies or identities or values. And it, it feels like it's not just someone's got a different opinion about a political issue, but it's very personal too. You know, oh, somebody has an opinion about immigration. Well, I'm an immigrant. And so what does that mean? Or somebody has, you know, a view about um you know, I, I mean, I hear lots of conflict about, you know, women who are staying home and raising children versus women who are in the workplace versus women who don't have a choice about whether or not to be in the workplace or be at home. There's lots of different kinds of, of places where, um, where there's different kinds of views on things that are about how we are living our lives and the choices that we're making. So we might feel really judged by other people. We might feel threatened by the kinds of policies that people are advocating for because they'll affect us. That politics is deeply personal. And is that what your book, Beyond Your Bubble, is really in de in, uh, designed to help us see past and get through? So Beyond Your Bubble is very practical. I am a researcher, but I did not want to write this like a research study. I wanted to write this so that here is something that's going to give you some skills and some strategies to actually have these conversations. So it's it's not um, so theoretical as it is like, here's what listening is. Here's what it looks like in these kinds of dialogues across political lines. Here's some activities you can try to build up your listening skills. Okay, here's a chapter on managing emotions. If you feel like you're going to blow your top in the middle of a conversation or anticipating a conversation, here's what you should do about it. And here's what that would look like in a conversation. So I really do try to make it very concrete and very practical because I think that's what people need right now. They don't need for me to be, you know, going on about the theory of all of these things they want to figure out what to do because people are struggling so much. And so I just wanted to provide a resource that could help people with that struggle. That space between emotional stimulus and our response. Um, what's, what are some of your tried and true tactics to help us sort through that when we are feeling the emotions bubble up and come to the surface? The best things that we can do, first of all, are notice that it's happening. So the more aware we are of what's going on, and we can know it in our bodies. You know, you start to feel flushed, your muscles are tense, your, your heart's beating faster. Okay, that says you're in this fight, flight, or freeze response. So what do you do about that? So one of the best things that we can do is something that we're doing all the time, which is to breathe. Uh, but we're not always breathing in such a way that's going to help to calm us. So the way that I always say, and I obviously love bubbles because I call the book Beyond Your Bubble, but if you breathe as if you're blowing bubbles, as if you have one of those little plastic bottles and the little wand, and you breathe in deeply, and then you let the air out slowly, so just imagining that you're blowing bubbles. And the other person doesn't even have to know that you're doing it. Um, so it can really help to calm and ground you so that then you can just be more present for and more effective in having a conversation. As long as you're not blowing bubbles like my kids who just like mo mostly spit at the wine rather than. <laughs> <laughs> right. You need to practice so you know how to effectively blow the bubbles. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Tanya, what is a question that you wish you were asked more? That's a great question. <laughs> and I don't know that I have a good answer to it. I feel like because there have been 
uh, so many struggles that people are having with it. I'm getting the opportunity to answer a lot of questions. And I've been talking a lot on podcasts. I've been talking on media. I think the thing that I would want is for media to be not necessarily asking me questions more, but covering more of the exhausted majority, covering more of the people who are doing work to bring folks together and focusing more on that. We certainly need to know about what's going on on the extremes, but the but we're hearing so much more about it than we're hearing about other things that it really skews our perceptions of other people and where they likely are. So I think what I would want is not necessarily different questions of me, but just sort of amplifying that that connective tissue that is um, being built and practiced. Very similar to that, then, as you were saying that, it comes to mind, what questions do you think we should be asking ourselves more, ourselves more, as we try to make our way through the muck? <laughs> mm-hmm. I think the first question is, what's my goal? What am I trying to accomplish here? And then the second question is, are my strategies and my behavior actually helping me to reach that goal. And one of the things I learned is that often people have more than one goal. So they might say, well, my goal is to try to convince more people to get vaccinated, but I also have a goal of expressing myself openly when I am feeling uh, anger toward, you know, about something. And so those goals might be in conflict with each other. So I think it's recognizing when we have multiple goals and figuring out what we want to do with it. You know, okay, well, maybe you vent your anger somewhere else, or maybe you recognize your anger is not necessarily at this specific person, but at, you know, media figureheads who are influencing this person. Um, so, So I think sorting out a little bit more of what's going on inside all of us, and we can all help each other with that too. We can all ask each other these questions. We can ask people who are on the same side as we are, what's keeping you from reaching out to people who have a different view? Beautiful. Love it. Tanya, thank you so much for this. How can people follow along with your work, follow you on social media? And I know we've spent some time disparaging it, but (laughs) you're doing great things on there. How can can people connect? So my website is tanyaisrael.com. And on social media, I'm BYB Dialogue for Beyond Your Bubble Dialogue. And uh, I try to provide a lot of resources and those kinds of things will help to amplify the, the connectivity. And so I really hope that people find that helpful and that it moves them toward what they want and it moves us all toward a more connected and stronger community and democracy. I love it. I'll be supporting you and following you the whole way. Thank you so much for doing this, Tanya. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This has been delightful. My main takeaway from that conversation with Tanya happened right there at the very end. What's my goal and do my strategies help that? Great stuff from Tanya Israel. So many thanks to her for joining me on the show this week. Please do me and Tanya a huge favor and share this episode with someone you know who might find some value in listening to today's conversation. Help me spread the good word about the importance of asking more questions. And if you like the conversations with the incredible guests that I have on each and every week, like Tanya Israel, please be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Subscribing also helps the show gain more reach. And that's what I'm trying to do here is spread this message of what it means to find common ground by asking more questions. If you ever want to get in touch with me, you can always email me at michael at thefollowupquestion.com or go to thefollowupquestion.com and reach out there. I'll catch you on the next episode of The Follow-Up Question. And until then, keep asking questions.